But you have to get on with the producer, and the producer has to get on with the director. It's a difficult relationship. When location shooting finished, production moved to the Fox lot to film the disastrous capsizing and its aftermath. Let's go make a rehearsal. Yeah, let's make a rehearsal. The capsizing of the SS Poseidon showcased an impressive array of special effects. What the hell's happening? It was achieved through a combination of live action shots and lifelike miniatures created by special effects veteran L.B. Abbott. So the first thing I had to do was to think, well, what would happen? Well, it would go like that, and of course, everything would start slipping off the tables, and then it would go a bit further, and they'd hit the side wall. And finally, people would be hanging by their hands, dropping from the ceiling, which had been the floor, down into the mess below. We had a piece of set that we actually tilted and right in the beginning, when the ship starts to roll, we tilted the set and literally dumped the cast out of that set. And I did it by picking up one side of the set with a forklift. I mean, it was that cheap. Jesus Christ, what happened? We've turned over. Erwin Allen himself was on hand, helping to direct the elaborate action sequences. The difficult scene became a true collaborative effort on the part of an expert team. A couple of dead people, maybe somebody on the light here, Paul, right there. Would you raise your hand, those that are going to get killed, raise your hand. Stuntman turned actor Ernie Orsatti was chosen to perform the stunt that would become the most unforgettable moment in one of the most terrifying movie scenes of all time. But there was a last moment setback. Ernie says, I don't want to do this. I'm an actor now. He says, I want to double. <laughs> and so I said, Ernie, I'll be killed, and so will you, because this was all my idea, and you better get up on that table and go for it. So he went up, and anyway, he's hanging there, and he's going, Creever, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> the rest is history. May I have your attention, please? That's the way out. That's our only chance. We're floating upside down. We've got to climb up. Both cast and crew still had a grueling 12 weeks ahead of them. But as they began their odyssey through Irwin Allen's vision of hell turned upside down, it became clear to everyone that the true star of the film would be William Creeber's ingeniously designed set. Creeber used detailed photographs and blueprints of the Queen Mary to create an environment of astounding realism. It was just awesome to walk in there and look, because it was so real and so wonderful. And we began to see then how wonderful this film could be, that we had never seen anything like this. Years before the arrival of computer-generated imagery, the crew of the Poseidon Adventure brought to life some of the most difficult special effects ever attempted. And the water, the fire, and the explosions were all real. There was steam coming at us. There was fire on water. It was all so real. It was happening. We, we didn't have to act with imaginary things. And I'm amazed that when I look at them now, I say, how the hell did we do that? And how did we do it on so little money? You know, we didn't have the laser, all this technical stuff that they have now. And it was all, almost horrifying to the production people doing budgets when they realized what it was going to take to do that scene. They didn't realize how many hoses and firemen and standbys and cameras, you know, two or three cameras and cranes and everything. For Irwin Allen, the number one priority was the safety of everyone on the set. He was always there, and he was always pleading one thing, be careful. Okay, so that no one is in danger, is that That's right? right. That's not one chance in 10 million. He was so worried about his cast and crew that you wouldn't believe. No one ever got hurt. And you saw pianos falling and you saw people coming through skylights. It was the most amazing thing. It was a very difficult film to make physically and because you were walking on this middle of a pipe and where you've got that much steam and smoke on a set, it's tiring. Physically, it was... Uh, I would say it was almost an annoying picture to do. 
We had to be wet down every day. It, it was very uncomfortable. Each of them had a temperament about once every 10 days, which was pretty good. But of course, that was one a day for me, you see. <laughs> so I had to cope with one of them blowing their top. For one scene that required a frightening 40-foot climb, director Ronald Neem realized that some heroism was called for. He says, I want you to know that Mr. Creever here has made it totally safe for you, so you have nothing to worry about. And <laughs> he turns around and literally runs up through the set, swings like an ape up through this whole set, all the way to the top. I don't know his age then, but he shouldn't have been doing that. But anyway, he, he proved a point, and everybody went. Despite the 125 stunt people on hand, many cast members opted to do much of their own stunt work. Come on, what are you doing up there? Taking a coffee break? Move it, move it! They all wanted to do it themselves. It sort of grew, you know. I mean, the, the one didn't want to be out done by the other. Hey! The blood starts to run faster, you know, and you say, hot dog, here we go. <laughs> and sometimes I said to myself, what am I doing? But I did it. But no one could outdo Shelley Winters in her underwater swimming scene. A dedicated method actress, Winters had gained 35 pounds to become more believable in her role as the portly Mrs. Rosen. But that wasn't enough. She also asked the head stuntman to teach her to swim like her character, a former underwater swimming champion. I'm a very good swimmer. Johnny Weissmuller taught me to swim years ago in Brooklyn, but I want to practice underwater swimming. Anybody timing him? I am. You see, he's swimming through corridors and up and down stairwells. I'm the only one here trained to do things like that. Uh oh, what's the matter? The rope, it, it's not gone through. What do we do? What do we do? Well, be careful. Now, you think I'm planning to be careless? <laughs> what the hell does she think she's doing? She insisted on doing it. She would not take a stunt woman. She did that swimming and holding her breath and coming up. Uh, she deserves a lot of credit because it was a tough, tough scene. She must have found him. Oh, thank God. You see, Mr. Scott, in the water, I'm a very skinny lady. Despite the tremendous technical challenges, shooting was completed two full days ahead of schedule. Rogo! Get them through! And although he loved expensive special effects, <laughs> Irwin Allen never forgot that his first responsibility as a producer was to bring his film in under budget. But one casualty of his conscientious spending was a special effects shot intended to supply the very last image of the film, an aerial view of the capsized ship as the survivors fly off in a helicopter. It just looked awful. And so we, you know, well, let's reshoot it. Well, what's that going to cost? And his, his attitude about bringing that picture in absolutely on budget was so heavy, he just wouldn't approve redoing it. With shooting successfully completed, Irwin Allen's professional gamble appeared to have paid off. But the Poseidon survivors still faced one more obstacle that would test whether Irwin's folly would be a failure. Coming up, the actors get a chance to dry off and Irwin Allen gets his place in the sun. More than three years after he had begun work on his production, Irwin Allen was finally ready to unveil the finished product. Premiering on December 12, 1972, the Poseidon adventure was bigger, more sensational, and more frightening than anything Hollywood had turned out in years. And audiences went wild for it. For Irwin Allen, it represented a tremendous professional and personal triumph. I can't imagine anything being more exciting. When it opened up, we went down to Westwood, I remember, and we looked 
uh, and saw a big, huge line around the block. And we couldn't believe our eyes. I think it was one of the first pictures of that era where people went back to see it 10, 15, 20 times, you know? Unbelievable to me. It was popular all over the world. Amazing thing, isn't it? To think that you can do something that's seen by every people in the world, practically, and they come up and say, oh, that ship that you were on, La Barca, La Barca, the, the ship, you know, in Spanish. And it was the most amazing thing you've ever seen in your life. Critics liked the Poseidon adventure almost as much as the general public did, and so did members of the motion picture industry. The film was nominated for nine Academy Awards, eventually winning two, one for the song, The Morning After. Oh, can't you see the morning after? And another for outstanding visual effects. Studio executives no longer referred to the Poseidon adventure as Irwin's folly. Instead, they looked on with awe as it went on to become Hollywood's top grossing film of 1973, earning nearly $100 million at the box office. And as for Irwin's pals, Cheryl Corwin and Steve Broidy, who had rescued the film during their gin rummy game. For them, the Poseidon adventure turned out to be the investment of a lifetime. Ironically, none of them had ever been asked to write a check for any of the money they had promised. They made tremendous profits, especially for never having to put up a cent. Irwin Allen was suddenly one of the most powerful producers in Hollywood. And for his next film, The Towering Inferno, both 20th Century Fox and Warner Brothers were anxious to put up a whopping $14 million. All right, go, man, go. The massive success of The Towering Inferno sealed Irwin Allen's title as Hollywood's undisputed master of disaster. Not only had he become Hollywood's top money-making producer, Irwin Allen had pioneered a whole new genre. His films inspired a string of imitators, and for years, audiences would associate the name Irwin Allen with disaster movies he didn't even produce. The Poseidon Adventure has now attained the status of a cult classic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Shelley Winter. It remains a perennial favorite on television and home video, and fans turn out in droves for special theatrical screenings around the country. It's like Rocky Horror Show. They know every line before it's said. They say it with it or before it. Even the stars of the film enjoy recounting their favorite scenes. I think it's when, it's when I, I lose my wife, uh, when she falls into the, uh, into the fire. And I go kind of berserk. Linda! 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 He says to Gene Hackman, you killed her, Linda, my Linda, the only woman I ever loved. You killed her, you killed her, you killed her. You killed her. Actually, he didn't say woman, the only thing he ever loved, but I like being called a woman, you know. The disaster classic has even inspired a stage satire and a musical parody. Well, Johnny, <laughs> your brother's dead. <laughs> Irwin Allen always considered the Poseidon Adventure one of his proudest accomplishments. And for those who knew the man as well as those who simply love his movies, he will always be remembered for his fascination with the fantasy world of the cinema and his ability to accomplish the impossible. I think he's one of the last of the truly original producers who would never take no for an answer and were full of ideas and chutzpah and, and uh, outrageousness and defied the law of possibility. Each new disaster film that comes along will always try to outperform the last, but the SS Poseidon has proven unsinkable.